ESPN Classic. Alabama, the nickname Bo is reserved for two separate species, domestic pigs that have gone wild and young boys of a similar persuasion. Among the latter was Vincent Edward Jackson, known in his hometown for an uncanny ability to hunt small game with a homemade slingshot and a talent for traveling in the woods. Blessed with the body of a man, he would mature into a two-sport athlete of near fabled stature. Then, one day, his athletic career turned sharply downward, and we all watched his long goodbye. Here is the short, bittersweet story of Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson was a personality that mainstream America felt comfortable with, with the smile, with the way uh, he was marketed. Bo knows baseball. Bo knows football. Bo knows basketball, too. No. <laughs> Bo, you don't know Diddley. The Bo Knows campaign actually took him far beyond the borders of sport. You used to see black market t-shirts that said, Bo knows your girlfriend, Bo knows your mother, Bo knows your sister. It was everywhere. A, B, C, D. Bo knows Leonard. One, two, three. Bo knows Gaudi. I got hooked on it because not only could people see me on the football or the baseball field, but they saw that this person is talented in other ways. Helping Nike spread the word that Bo knows was an autobiography that reached the number two spot on the New York Times bestseller list. Oh, don't sir. That's what you think, dude. It made him at least for one year, and maybe, maybe more, the number one athlete in the United States. Give it up for Bo Jackson. Bo on the charge. Bo is there. <laughs> it defies modern technology that he was the kind of physical specimen that he was and nobody catches Bo touchdown <laughs> and hits this ball deep to right center field way back forget it i saw him just literally fly through the air so many times just like superman to make a catch jackson what a catch in left field he had that kind of very rare combination of explosive quick start speed and tremendous power on impact. Here's Bo, and here goes Bo. One day he's walking back to the dugout, and he was so disappointed and so mad at himself for swinging at a breaking ball in the dirt for strike three. And he had his bat on top of his helmet, and he just started pulling. The bat shattered in two. How do you practice that? When he walked through a locker room, everyone else stopped whatever they were doing just to stare at him. He is still the only man be chosen for the baseball all-star game and be elected to the football pro bowl in the same year there was some sense that he was playing just to play when he tried to do both hey he's remarkable and look at that when paul jackson says hello when he led the game off off rick rush would hit a home run i couldn't believe it i mean here he is leading off his first all-star game i thought he'd be nervous and i'm asking him on deck bo jack you nervous no oh, paul i ain't nervous later in the game he stole a base I think he and Willie Mays were the only two guys ever to hit a home run and steal a base in an all-star game. And Bo was the MVP. Bo was the show. We were all night. Wow. You know, this, this guy can do anything he wants to do. 
Even when Jackson suffered a hip injury in January 1991, Nike kept the campaign rolling by writing it into the script. Everyone here at Nike just assumed, hey, he would be out for a couple of weeks, and then boom, he'd be right back in it. And so we built commercials that were geared around his rehab. So Bo's gonna bum hip, so what? Look what he's doing with that hip. He's hitting the bike, he's hitting the weights. I think you hear me knocking, and I think I'm coming in, and I'm bringing Bo and his big bad hip with me. But Jackson's injury was serious enough to require hip replacement surgery in April 1992. There was something here today, gone tomorrow, about Bo that kept him from being everything he could be. Just that frightening ability to maneuver so much body mass and run away from smaller, seemingly faster people. There's no way of knowing how great he might have been had he stayed healthy. Although his career was, was brief, I'm going to tell you, if there's a shooting star that was brighter than this guy, I'd like to see it. taste that won't fill you up and never let you down. Make it a Bud Light. Bessemer is a very poor town. Uh, you know, it, it was a steel mill town, and the steel mills dried up. A lot of run-down houses. Uh, like I said, it was a poor black section. It was just, uh, it was poor. The street that he lived on was a dirt street. And there were no houses there that, that would be considered in the least bit anything more than functional. Vincent Edward Jackson spent his childhood amidst severe poverty in central Alabama. Born in 1962, he was the eighth of ten children. They all had to sleep in the same room. Each one of them having to sleep, you know, on the floor, or, you know, pile up around the heat or whatnot in the wintertime. With no father figure in the household, the family was held together by Vincent's mother, Florence. I will always say that my mother is my hero. She went to great length to make sure that all 10 of her kids knew that they were loved. Sometimes she worked three jobs, working seven days a week from sunup to sundown, just having enough time to come home, lay her head down, and go to sleep so she can get up the next morning at 4 o'clock to be at work at 5 o'clock in the morning. Big and strong for his age, Jackson was plagued by a humiliating speech problem. When I was a kid, the most terrifying thing to me was reading in class or answering a question in class or just asking a question in class. I wouldn't do that because I was terrified of stuttering and having my classmates laugh at me. He go to stuttering and go to sweating and wiping his head and the kids get to giggling and laughing at him and he had to turn around and tell him, I'll see you after school. I would let my older cousins punch me in the chest with their fists as hard as they could just so, just so I can let the other kids know around the neighborhood how tough I am. I was a John Gotti of my neighborhood. I once hit my cousin with a baseball bat, female. And I would have hit her a second time, but my older sister grabbed me as I stood over her and was about to whack her again. Jackson's violent nature was met head on by his mother. Whatever I get my hands on first to whoop you with, that's what you're gonna get whipped with. It could have been a broom handle. It could have been an extension cord from a lamp. <laughs> If he didn't do what he's supposed to do, she'd just pick up anything, you know, and, and try to knock him out. I think this was on a Saturday morning, and I said something to the fact that, well, you just told me to do one thing, and I, but, and I can't do two things at once. Who do you think I am? Oh, and she heard me. She had the extension cord in one hand and a 38 pistol in the other hand, and she said, you run now. I got something to catch you. One day when Jackson was 13, he and his friends visited a neighborhood pig farm with mischief on their minds. Me, being the head rock thrower of the group, uh, we started hitting pigs. I bet we killed about six, seven thousand dollars worth of pigs. We were wailing away on this big pig. I mean, huge, three, four hundred pound pig. We were wailing away on it, and a shot rang out. Bow. After that, 
Of course, the sheriff came. They went directly to Bow House. His mom, um, she was like, take him on to jail, whatever you're going to do with him, you know? I guess she was just kind of fed up with him. And my mother said, well, look, if the owner want to press charges, she said, I am not paying for any pigs that you destroyed, especially when you didn't bring the damn meat home. She said, I tell you what, if he wants to, I am going to let the judge send you off to reform school. And uh, I didn't want to go through that. So I finally confessed. When Jackson went out for the football team at McAdory High School, his mother was not happy. She said, if you practice today, this house will be locked up when you come home. Sure enough, it's locked up. She had to sleep in the car. Despite his mother's reaction, Jackson persisted and became a three-sport star. It began on the football field, where he played on both sides of the ball. The only time he came off the field was for punts. He returned punts, he returned kicks, he played defense. And Bo would come down the line, his responsibility was taking the quarterback on the option. He'd tackle the quarterback, quarterback would pitch the ball, Bo would get up and run down the pitch man and tackle him for a one-yard loss. In the spring, he was the best player on McAdory's baseball team. He'd hit two home runs, two at-bats, and the left hitter was playing up against the fence the third time up, playing really deep. And Bo hits a towering fly ball. And he hit it between the third baseman and left fielder, and he hit it sky high. And Bo started jogging first because he thought he was out. And Coach Brazil, he yelled at him to start running. So Bo started running. The ball drops in, so I'm going to hold Bo up at second. So I throw my hands up like this to hold him up. He's on top of me at third. And I'm like, this, I just do this, and he makes a short loop and scores stand up. And the place went crazy. And these scouts came by and said, it's impossible. No one can run that fast. So they had people hit fly balls, people running just to see, and none of them got past second. Jackson also ran track, his favorite sport. He won two state decathlon championships. He said, could I have a future in track when I leave high school? I said, well, no, because you got to make the Olympics first, and then from there, yeah, you have a future. When he wasn't running track, Jackson was on the baseball field, where his talent for throwing hard penalized him. He hated to pitch, but the guy was so overpowering with everybody else that, you know, everybody else could sit down in the outfield because they knew once Bo got up there, the, the kids couldn't hit him. I hated it with a passion because it was boring. You stood there on the mound and you ended up with throw balls, throw balls, throw balls. First game he's out there and he throws four straight balls, the first batter, and kind of looks at me like, I'm thinking, all right, let's just see who's the toughest wheel here. I walked three batters in a row on purpose, and he come out of the dugout and he sat on a bucket of balls and just sit there and stared at me. Like, all right, if you walk another batter, you will pay. <laughs> Well, I guess he realized that he was a waste of time, so then he struck out the next three. We had lost about four in a row. He came up to me just furious. He said, Coach, they, they, they just don't care. He said, I'm just, I, I got to do something to get them up. He was crying, just furious. And I was so angry until, yeah, my eyes walled up. And I, but, and I start crying. I said, I am not a loser. And I'd be damned if I'm going to let you all make me a loser. I like winning. Remarkably, Bo's senior year in high school, he was not voted the outstanding athlete uh, in his class. The vote went to the quarterback on the football team, uh, who was white. Some of the rumors flying around was that I was going to win the award. And some of the uh, black students felt like that it was, you know, a racial issue that, you know, Bo was by far the better athlete. Oh, we almost had a riot down at the school. All of the black students thought that I should have won, which it really didn't matter to me. And for a couple of days, you had the blacks on one side, the whites on the other. Our principal called all the seniors in the library right after that. I kept the athletes downstairs in the locker room, and both said, Coach, I want to go to the library with the seniors. You could hear a pin drop. He said, let me tell you all something. He said, I didn't come to this school to get a bunch of awards. I came here to get education. I said, it doesn't matter who says who is the best athlete or the best person about this. I got three more months here. When I leave this high school, I may never come back. My main goal right now is to graduate on time and go on with my life. He saw the opportunity to not only uh, 
make a future for himself, but to help his mom out who had been just working herself to death to raise those kids and to give them everything. And so he really got focused and, and knew that he had a chance to be something special. Phones, everybody. <laughs> he could have turned professional right out of high school. He could have signed with the New York Yankees, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to go to college because he wanted to please his mother, and I think he wanted to please himself, too. In 1982, after Jackson tied the national high school record by hitting 20 home runs, he turned down a $250,000 offer from Steinbrenner's Yankees. He would choose a college close to home. The question was, would it be Alabama or Auburn? For years, if Alabama wanted a marquee player or a great athlete out of the Birmingham area, it was just a, a foregone conclusion that that athlete was going to Alabama. Ken Donahue, Bear Bryant's defensive coordinator, helped make up Jackson's mind. And he told me, he said, Bo, I'm going to be honest with you. We would love to have you at Tuscaloosa. He said, but my honest opinion is that I don't think you'll get a chance to play until the end of your sophomore or the beginning of your junior season. The only other big school here is Auburn. Auburn hasn't beat Alabama since 1972, and they will never beat Alabama. The Auburn head coach was more optimistic. He saw our situation here, that he could come in and, and just by the sheer numbers, you know, be a starter right off. He said, I can see you coming down there, playing, and turning this program around uh, your freshman year. And he said, I would just like to know if you would consider coming to Auburn. I said, I am coming to Auburn. And he's like, OK, and he turned and walked off. And that's all was said. He signed with Auburn with this incredible obsession that he could go to Auburn and he would show Alabama. Jackson arrived at Auburn in the summer of 1982. You just sat there and, you, you know, watching practice, you saw him do it with your own eyes, but you just couldn't believe what you were looking at. Pat turned to us and, and, and he was looking to see if we had seen what Jackson had just done. And, and he said, did you, did you see that? And he smiled and said, it's hard to miss a Cadillac. If Jackson's athletic transition to college was smooth, the same cannot be said for his social life. The most amazing thing was that he was shy. Once he got to college, he understood why he was shy. He had a speech impediment. And from that speech impediment, he would much rather stay away from people than to be around people. I get a, a collect phone call on Saturday afternoon. You know, a couple hours after a game, coach this boat. Yeah, how's it going? Oh, I'm just sitting here in my room. Why are you doing that? Bo, isn't there a lot going on? But I don't want to go to any of that stuff. You know, I don't go to parties. I got homesick, to be honest with you. Uh, and the week before the Alabama game, my freshman year, I decided, well, I'm going to go home. I guess he had gotten fed up with, with some stuff down at Auburn, and so he decided to go to the bus station and go back home. He sat there till 3 or 4 in the morning. Every time a bus would leave, and he'd think maybe he's going to get on it and go back home. He'd think about how much he was going to let his mother down, his family down. I would disappoint my mother and everybody that looked up to me as, well, he's gone on to college, and he's done something with his life. I just don't want to be another person that's just hanging around the neighborhood, not doing anything with his life. When you saw Bo Jackson, you saw how proud he was. You knew where that came from. It came from his mom. He never made a decision without her. You know, if she called down there and said she was having any kind of problems, you know, he was gone. If he was having problems, she was the first somebody that he would call. She didn't raise a quitter. She didn't raise anyone to start something and not finish it. She played a very important role in getting him back to Auburn. As a freshman, Jackson met Alabama on Legion Field, Birmingham. He was ready, more than ready. I remember being down on the field in, in, in warm-ups and talking to the Auburn coaches and, and Pat talking about his team was ready and, and he pointed over there to Jackson and said, my biggest job right now is to keep this guy, his motions in check. Give the ball up and over and in, I believe, touchdown! Touchdown, Auburn! The Auburn Tigers. 
have defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide by the score of 23 to 22 in this monumental victory, ladies and gentlemen. It seemed like everything happened in slow motion because you had red and white jerseys diving everywhere. You had blue and white jerseys going everywhere. We went over the top, and when I came down, my head and the football was across the goal line. First amount he went looking for was his mom, the person who he shared all his intimate moments with, uh, you know, and, and, and just start crying, you know, weeping like a little baby. I start crying because she was happy, and all of these people sitting up around her telling her how great her son is. And I loved her, and she said, everything's going to be all right, baby, everything's going to be all right. And I cried, and we celebrated. As he did in high school, Jackson played baseball in the spring. He made the ballpark smaller in every way. He made the distance between the bases smaller with his world-class speed. He made the outfield fences shorter because of the greatness of his arm. He's the only player I ever saw who literally could defy the geometry of the game, and so you had to be in awe of that. He went to Athens to play Georgia, and it was the first night they were celebrating the first time that the University of Georgia had lights on their baseball field. Biggest crowd in Georgia history, Bo steals the show. His first three at-bats, he hits home runs, and his third at-bat, he hit one literally on the brand new light tower about 450 feet away, and the ball rattles around up there, and you fully expect the lights to burst just as they did in the movie The Natural. Even the Georgia fans, what is this guy gonna do next? However brilliantly he played baseball, Jackson was a national hero on the gridiron. An All-American with over 1,200 yards rushing in his sophomore year, he missed half his junior season because of a shoulder injury. Jackson entered his senior year a favorite to win the Heisman Trophy in 1985, but in his third game, ran into trouble. He played against Tennessee and got, he got a deep thigh bruise. We took him out of ball game, and he didn't play anymore that game. Five weeks later against Florida, the thigh injury flared up and forced Jackson to the sideline. His injury was the biggest story in the state when you had rumors of Bo Jackson sloughing off uh, and just can't play. What few people knew was that Jackson played the last two games of the season with cracked ribs. Coach died just to shut the media up. He brought the x-rays to the press conference and showed everybody, do you see this? One rib is totally separated and the other one is cracked. He said, well, do you know who x-rays these are? And these x-rays were taken just four or five days ago. You know who x-rays these are? He said, those are Bo Jackson's x-rays. Despite his injuries, Jackson finished the season strong. Averaging 162 yards per game, he scored 17 touchdowns as Auburn compiled an 8-3 record. Nevertheless, he found himself the center of the most competitive Heisman race in history. In the closest vote, in the history of this trophy, the winner is from Auburn University, Bo Jackson. A small note of controversy. Some detractors said that you had pulled yourself out of some key games this year with some injuries that you might have played through. What's your response to that? Well, the only thing that I can say about that is I know what I can do, and I am not a quitter. And if I feel that it's necessary for me to take myself out of competition, it's not because I'm a coward. At the start of the 1985 season, it probably wasn't that important to him. I think it became important to him because of those people questioning him. The thrill of winning the Heisman soon dissipated in the face of another controversy that ended Jackson's senior season in baseball after 21 games. It began innocently enough with a ride to Tampa Bay on the plane of Buccaneers owner Hugh Culverhouse. And he picked me up on the jet. We flew down, took my physical, got back. Somebody called and said, well, you took a ride on the jet, so you are ineligible to play baseball. He had tried religiously to go through the proper channels and the, and the proper process, but had been betrayed by information that came out of the Southeastern Conference office in Birmingham. Later, Bo Jackson resented that big time, that something had been done to jeopardize his college future. That really hurt because I felt that I was taken advantage of and I felt that the people at Tampa Bay knew what they were doing just so I wouldn't play baseball.
To all that stuff you carry around, ever had trouble? Maybe. Yes, sir! You're watching ESPN Classic. The Buccaneers select first choice on the first round. Running back from Auburn, Bo Jackson. <laughs> In 1986, Bo Jackson faced an extremely difficult decision. The baseball people are pulling me that way, and the football people are pulling me that way. But once I make my decision, it won't be because somebody said, well, it'll be best for you to do this or do that. I don't think many people in this state ever even considered that he would play anything but football until right before it happened. If Tampa Bay had a, a traded my rights to someone else, I probably would have just went on and played. But I knew that I was good enough to play in the big league. I'll just play baseball and then see about football later. It was a huge surprise when Bo decided he was gonna play baseball. Everybody thought it was just a ploy uh, to get more money. They thought he was kidding. Jackson was drafted by Kansas City in the fourth round and assigned to the double-A Memphis Chicks. First, however, he was invited to Royal Stadium for a workout. I remember he walked to the locker room one day in Kansas City and wearing his uh, pinstripe suit. And he's handing out pictures of him in the Heisman Trophy Award to us Major League Baseball players. A lot of guys kind of looked at it, just pitched it. I hung mine on my locker, kind of teased him. How McCray followed him and kept picking him up. <laughs> and he'd say, you're in the big leagues now, son. You know, we don't care about your Heisman here. We saw this magnificent stone of a baseball player that needed to be cut, that needed to be polished, that needed to be refined. And when it was, it would be the crown jewel. And that's what he became. When he first showed up for the Memphis Chicks to play his first professional game, you would have thought that Elvis had come back. And this guy was almost bigger than Elvis at that point in time. He was a guy that could create mania just by being. After two months in the minors, Jackson joined the Royals. When he first came up in baseball, everybody looked at him like, who's he kidding? He, he had a lot of raw ability, but he swung and missed a lot and struck out a lot and, and really struggled the first year. He had a lot of ability, but he just didn't spend a lot of time playing baseball. For someone to make it to the major leagues as quick as he did, just goes to show you what a tremendous athlete he was. The first home run that Bo hit that I remember was in September. He hit it off of Mike Moore, who was pitching for Seattle. It landed about half to three quarters of the way up this grassy uh, expanse. And, and you, you look like, how could this happen? Mike Moore sat there and he started laughing on the mound. And he comes in and he goes, if I'm going to give him up, I could give him up. And it's the only time that we were like high-fiving a pitcher for giving up a home run. There's one time I was talking to Buck O'Neill, and Bo was taking bat practice. And Buck O'Neill said he heard a sound. And he says, I've only heard one other sound like that. And he said, who was that? And he said, Josh Gibson. I hear that sound again. And man, I ran down the steps. I ran on the field. I wanted to see who was hitting that, but here's another pretty black sucker. Bo Jackson was hitting that ball. But after 25 games in September with Kansas City, Jackson turned his thoughts to football. I was approached by my agent and said, if you could play football after baseball season, would you consider it? I said, in a heartbeat. I've been doing that since I was in the ninth grade. I've been doing both sports, and I know I could do it. It seemed like arrogance, but it, but with Bo, it never, it never was arrogance. It was just, hey, I can do this. I can do this. It's not such a big deal. Having spurned the Bucks offer a year earlier, Jackson was re-entered into the 1987 NFL Draft. Raiders owner Al Davis took him in the seventh round. I wanted the first player who'd ever play two sports to play for the Raiders. Bo had a press conference before the game, and he sat there and he said that he was going to take up a hobby. Football was going to be a hobby. The reaction was, that, you know, who is this guy to think that he can regard football as a hobby and succeed in it? I think the Royal Front Office was upset. I think we all felt the same way. Why, Bo? Why? You know, why? Why? You, you've got a chance to be the ultimate superstar in this game. Why turn your back on that? After hitting 235 and striking out 158 times in 1987, football seemed perhaps a greater attraction for Jackson. If you were going to play baseball, you have to give it 100%. And if you're going to play football, you have to give it 100%. And I thought that he was cheating 
the Los Angeles Raiders and the Kansas City Royals. I do remember Willie Wilson walking around with a bat stuck between his legs. The symbolism somewhat obvious in terms of what Bo was doing to the team and basically what the front office was letting Bo do to the team. Are I can remember when he first came to us. He was running the ball, and he came aside and I said, Art, will you just tell the rest of them to please just get out the way? If they're not going to block, just get out the way, because guys were in all of them. They're standing up watching him run. He had just gotten there and had very little practice, and he's sitting there frustrated and, and says to me, I didn't come here to sit on the damn bench. We play next week in Seattle. I'm going to win the thing by myself. In Bo Jackson's fifth NFL game, he celebrated his 25th birthday with 221 yards rushing that was highlighted by a 91-yard touchdown. And Bo Jackson to the 20 and out in front. And only one man to beat, and nobody catches Bo. Touchdown. <laughs> he may not stop yep. the coma. <laughs> He's gone. He just took off and went, boom, you know, like there was a jet came in. He was running so fast he couldn't slow down. He just ran all the way up to the tunnel, and they lost him. And the cam was going, bo, 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 bo. You know, he was, he was gone. There was no guy there. They flip him the ball, and to watch him hit the corner, it's just all thighs and ass. And it, it was a remarkable sight to watch. You don't think he's running fast, and then suddenly he's not there. There was one time I swear I saw flames coming out of his shoes. Here's Brian Bosworth. You know, at, at this point, you know, you know, Boz had not quite been unmasked, you know, as the hype he was going to be. People still thought of him as a big-time linebacker prospect. Brian was talking all this smack about what he was going to do to Bo. Bo Jackson was going to do this. Bo's not going to do that. It was me, Bosworth, and the goal line. Here's Bo. He and Bosworth one-on-one, -on -one, and Jackson just shoves him into the end zone. I think he saw in my eyes a moment of hesitation, and he said, I'm, I'm going for it. And he went ahead and went uh, more toward the flag, which then put my head on the wrong side of him. It was like you jumping out in front of a bus, a transit bus, trying to catch the bus and stop it. And I carried him to the end zone when I got back to the sideline. And everybody was wondering, so what did you say to that SOB? I jokingly said, but I told him, next time have bus fare. Well, that was the day that the whole bow thing came to fruition. And that was really just the exclamation point behind the, you know, this is no hype. Meanwhile, in his other sport, Jackson was beginning to make the same kind of impact. By 1989, he had established himself as a bona fide power hitter with 32 home runs and 105 RBI. Against the Mariners, he made a throw for the ages. He made the greatest throw I ever saw in, in Seattle. To me, uh, Harold Reynolds was running. I take off, I get a great jump, ball into the left field corner. I'm thinking, ain't no way they're going to get me. I'm flying full speed around second. Bo gets the ball. He just turns around and just, just throws the ball. Threw it as hard as I could. I threw it where I thought home plate would be. And the next hitter is going slide. I'm thinking, slide? Are you crazy? He can do it. Yes, he can. I don't believe it. He made an absolutely perfect throw. And I hop up and I slam my helmet down because I'm like, no way, he a mile out, no way. When he looked out there where I was standing, I kind of pulled my pistols out and shot him. Put it back in my holster. Well, the next day I came out during BP and they're out there stretching. I jump on his back. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me! You threw me out like that. And you, 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 you can't run on this. He said, you aren't human. He said, you are from another planet. We should make you go pee in a cup and <laughs> see what you do, just to see what you're made out of. Be up and never let you down. Good race. Thanks. Make it a floodlight. Playing a great game, playing a super game. We ran a play where I bounced off tackle. And I think I had to beat one guy, and he clamped down on my right leg, which stopped me dead in my tracks. But the momentum of my body kept going, and my left leg was extended to the point where I couldn't bend it and fall. He had such force across his hip joint 
that I hyperextended his knee, he pulled his hip right out the back of the socket. And I popped it back in the socket as I'm laying there. And I stood up and I felt a sharp pain up in that pelvic socket. And it felt like somebody had jabbed an ice pick up in there. And I said, I think I need to go to the sideline because I think this is a little bit worse than I think it is. It reminded me of lions tracking their prey and taking on an animal much bigger than they, but it takes more than one. And in a way, Bo Jackson's injury was like a you know, beautiful rhino being taken down. He stood on the sidelines for most of the rest of the game. His kid came back out down on the stands and played with him on the sidelines while the game was being finished. Bo knew he was injured, but he'd been injured before, and he assumed that, you know, he would heal. The next day, I went to take an MRI, and he said, do you see all that dark stuff? He said, that's blood in your hip socket. And for the first time in my life, I got lightheaded, nauseous to where I almost passed out, and I had to sit down. Wow. I really injured myself. And it took me some time to get over the fact that I probably wouldn't play football again. Jackson's attempts at rehabilitation in 1991 met with little success. He was still hobbling when he arrived at the Royal Spring Training Camp. I said, what? Bo's on crutches? And sure enough, he was on crutches, and of course that was the, uh, the beginning of the end as far as uh, Bo goes with the Royals. Jackson was released by the Royals on March 18, 1991. I thought that, you know, as much as Bo could still do, at least they'd give him another shot, or at least a chance to let him get well. Right now, I'm not in the best health um, that I've been in in the past, but um, don't count me out because I know deep down inside that I'll be back playing baseball this year. Still not knowing the extent of his injury, Jackson signed with the White Sox two weeks later and continued his rehabilitation. He showed pain, but never admitted to pain. I always, you know, one of my main questions is, does that bother you? He's like a freak of nature. Even if it hurts, he doesn't admit it. He's an incredibly mentally tough guy. I watched him in the outfield with like a parachute on him and with a, they had like a harness on him. They were trying to develop and regain the strength in the hip. This guy was pounding across the outfield, pulling our strength coach behind him like a plow horse. I was among the people who was in the stands when he had that last at bat down in spring training and when he hobbled to first base. And it was, you know, one of the saddest things you ever want to see. Here is this man at an infinite speed, uh, just, just stumbling uh, uh, down the field. It was very hard to watch. It wasn't sad because Bo was trying to play because Bo was doing a courageous thing. But it was sad in the context that he wasn't the Bo Jackson he was before. The joint was really starting to fail. He said, uh, what do you think, Herm? And I said, I don't think you can go any further. I said, I think if you don't address this problem now, you're going to ruin the quality of your life for your future. While recovering from surgery in 1992, Jackson learned that his mother would soon leave him. It is a devastating thing to see the backbone of your family deteriorate and to have an illness such as cancer to take her away from you. I come back three weeks later after my hip surgery and she don't have the strength to sit up and I knew that she was suffering. I kissed her on her forehead and then I whispered in her ear and I told her, I said, Mom, I said, it's okay. You can go on and go. I said, because I know that you're tired and I know that you're worried if everybody's going to be all right. I said, I'll make sure that everybody's be all right. I'll take care of everybody. You don't have to hold on any longer. I said, it's okay. But before Florence would let go, her son made her a promise. She asked me before she passed, was I going to get my college education? And I said, just for you. I'm going to go back and finish up just for you. And she asked me if I was going to go back and play baseball. And I said, if I did, I would do it just for you. And the first hit I get will be for you. 
That ball hit deep to right field. Turnover goes back, looks up. You can put it on the board. Yes! Bo Jackson in his first event of the 93 season. What a moment this is for that man. I had some tears come down my face, to be honest with you. And I mean, that's not a real macho thing to say for a guy, but we spent a lot of time together. And then he came in after he hit it and gave me a big old hug and said, I love you. Well, that's good enough. You know, that's, that made me happy. And I got that ball, I took it to my jeweler, and he encased it in a block of acrylic with a little tag inside that said, just for you, Mom. That has to be the most gratifying moment in my athletic career period. After hitting 16 homers and striking out 106 times in part-time duty with the White Sox in 1993, Jackson was released. He joined the Angels in time for the 1994 season, hitting a career-high 279 with 13 homers when the players' strike began in August. While the players and owners wrangled, Bo Jackson quietly retired. I have been performing for other people besides my family since I left high school. And I think it's time for me just to settle down and, and be home a little bit more, uh, do things with my kids, and uh, start to be a dad instead of just being a number with a name over it. After virtually disappearing from the public eye, Jackson began a business career. He travels the country promoting better health and education for youngsters. Bo spends much of his time with his wife, Linda, and their three children. He's a good father, and that, to me, makes me as proud of him as anybody. Kids today already don't know who Bo Jackson was, and that, that's very sad. I thought he was the greatest athlete I ever saw for pure athleticism. I think he was the best, at it, and I hate to see that forgotten, but I don't think it bothers Bo at all. I never set out to be a Hall of Fame baseball player or a Hall of Fame football player. I just love to play, period. When you talk about great running backs of all time, you're going to forget Bo Jackson, but uh, Bo Jackson was one of the great running backs of all time. If he would have stuck to baseball, I think, and really dedicated himself, you know, he could have been one of the great players ever to play the game, in my opinion. You know, you can look back and say, what if? What if he had played 15 years and uh, starred in two sports? And would he have been the greatest athlete of the last century? Who knows? He falls into the heading of kind of a guy that, you know, there were kind of moments, you know, there were snapshots. But you feel cheated that you didn't get to see the whole album. In the wake of Bo Jackson's truncated career, we're left to wonder what might have been. His gifts as a baseball player were only beginning to emerge. How many homers might he have hit? How many bases might he have stolen? But it was as a power runner that Bo stopped our hearts. In his four seasons with the Raiders, Bo was on pace to eclipse Jim Brown's NFL record of 5.2 yards per carry. Averaging 5.4 yards, Bo had not reached the minimum 750 carries to qualify for the record. He had only just begun. For ESPN Classics Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler. This is ESPN Classics.